I'm going to talk about translation ethics, the translator ethics. I talk about intervention, about cooperation, about neutrality. And this is for master students at Al Quds University in East Jerusalem, in Al Quds, in what we might call Palestine. And I have a series of questions from them. And the questions sort of contain the, own, uh, the answers that the students want to hear. Uh, the questions about intervention, uh, about the impossibility of neutrality, uh, about quality in translation, um, and about how to act in situations of occupation and repression. And it's very clear to me that you want me to tell you that you have to resist, and that you have to use translation as one of the weapons of resistance, and uh, that intervention is the way to go. And I'm not going to tell you exactly that, and it's going to be quite difficult for me to get across an alternative point of view, because I know that you're living a, a situation or living close to those who are suffering most from that situation, uh, that makes my discourse sound very weak and naive, my discourse of cooperation and trust. So let me say from the outset that as people, as humans, uh, we all have to keep a light in these ages of darkness the light of human dignity, which is inviolable, and that we have to do that as humans in our daily lives and as citizens to the extent that it's politically possible. And that's a good ethical position to convey, and it doesn't mean that, 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 that uh, the appeal to human dignity means the same thing for me as it does for you or for anybody else. We all develop our own criteria from there. However, your questions concern how you should act as translators. And there, I think, we can venture into some rather different kinds of answers, simply because the communications that we carry out in our entire lives are um, much wider, much richer, much broader, and require a much uh, more demanding ethics than those of the specific communication acts we carry out as translators, which do contain their own criteria. And that's where I'm going to enter the issue. And now one of your questions was, what is translation quality? Uh, this is a question that I avoid as much as possible. If, if my students are doing a doctoral thesis and they want to measure quality, I suggest, please, please, Leave it aside. Don't look at it. It's too complicated, too complex. Everybody will disagree about it. You're not going to win. So let me start there. I think these days uh, there's a general tendency in translation studies to not look at quality in linguistic terms. That is, we're not comparing the translation with the start text and finding errors and doing a little sum and saying, oh, this is good, this is bad. Uh, I myself would prefer to look at quality as a relation between the translation and, and receiving and, and the receiver. And I think that reception analysis is the, 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 the big missing part of translation studies. I think that a translation of quality uh, involves the receiver in the communication act and moves them to do something or informs them so that they can take... Uh, um, uh, educated uh, actions in their lives. Uh, so for me, quality um, would be negative if a translation is, for example, just boring and doesn't move people to do anything and people stop reading it and it's no longer communicating. Uh, and that involvement, I think, is, is a sine qua non of, of a good translation that's going to achieve something as a communication act. Uh, now, to have involvement in a translational communication act, and this is where it gets tricky, 
you are going to need, as the mediator, you're going to need a degree of trust. You have to um, achieve a situation where the user of your product trusts you as the intermediary with some anterior product or communication act. And if you lose that trust, if people don't trust you, uh, then you've lost everything. They're not going to believe the text, they're not going to follow it, they'll stop reading, they'll look around for an alternative translator or an alternative means of access, and you have not just lost involvement in the Communication Act, you've lost the whole translational situation. Uh, I think that makes sense in terms of our everyday lives and relations with clients, for example, or when we do meet readers of our texts, uh, we, we can gauge whether or not they trust. And, and as readers, we, we, we all read a text, we see lots of blatant errors or, or bad use of the target language, and we lose trust. You know, that's a load of rubbish. Get rid of it. Okay? Now, this achieving of trust means that there must be at least the illusion of a linguistic relation with the anterior text. That is, you can't come in and just do anything you like because people will find out and people will stop trusting you as a mediator. They might trust you as a commentator or as a teacher, but as a mediator, as a translator, you will have lost trust. So, uh, to the extent that, that, that translation involves communicating with a cultural other in a different culture and different language, trust is essential. And a certain degree of linguistic propriety in, in what you're producing is absolutely necessary. You can't just intervene and do whatever you think is right in the text because you will lose trust as an intermediary. This also concerns the, the choice of the text we translate. Now, uh, intervention uh, might mean just translating the text that we think should be heard and getting rid of the others. Okay, we intervene in order to produce ideologically appropriate communication. Is that ethically valid? Well, it might uh, enhance trustworthiness. Uh, for example, one can imagine uh, fairly repressive regimes in some major countries of the world, which I hesitate to name, where uh, translators are instructed not to convey information that is contrary to the interests of the regime. And they are trusted by the regime because of that. In terms of uh, translational ethics, though, I suggest that we need something more, that a regime uh, requires that the voice of its enemies of those outside of it, the critical voices from within its society, be heard as a part of public debate and public discussion. And that there must be a form of trustworthiness whereby translators are able to convey those uh, uncomfortable opinions and points of view without being accused of being traitors and without losing trustworthiness. So. I'm moving towards something that is radically opposed to a world of, of communication bubbles, which is what we're moving into, especially in social media and uh, in, in all forms of electronic communication, where we have many, many social groups who only hear the information that they want to hear and, and filter out all the rest. Uh, and a, a high degree of intervention in the selection of texts is producing that kind of world which is the one we, we're moving towards increasingly in many parts of, of the globe. Uh, I think that that, that, that echo chamber, the, that those communication bubbles have to be overcome. We have to uh, attain degrees of communication between them and translation is absolutely necessary in order for that to be done. And that means translating the voice of the enemy whatever enemy that may be. I'm not going to talk about Palestine and Israel. I know enough to know that I don't know enough. 
Uh, but there are many, many situations of conflict around the world where these principles uh, might apply. Now, uh, thinking about those kind of problems, I uh, have proposed in the past that the translator should seek cooperation. And that has been misunderstood. Uh, for example, people assume that cooperation implies that all participants are politically equal, have the same degree of power. Uh, not so. Uh, that they're all friendly with each other. Uh, not so. That they're all on the same side. Uh, not so. Uh, that the translator is an honest broker who can decide, uh, like a mediator in, in a marriage uh, that's breaking up. No, not so. All of those things are myths that have been perpetuated by people who've never bothered to look at the actual theory of cooperation. What does cooperation say? It says that two people, or two anything, uh, can interact and communicate in order to achieve mutual benefits. This person achieves more than they had at the beginning, and this person achieves more than they had at the beginning. This is magic. This is the whole reason for social life and indeed perhaps for communication itself. It does not mean that if this person wins, that person loses. It's a not a zero sum. Okay. Now, it does not require, for cooperation to work, you do not require equality. You can be vastly unequal, unequal, sorry, unequal at the beginning as long as this person benefits something and that person benefits something, the Communication Act is considered ethically successful. Now, in order to get cooperation going, many, many things are required. One of them I just mentioned, trust. Uh, we have to trust the other uh, in order to attain a, an outcome. So when you know economists and, and, and negotiation theorists lose, uh, learn this and do their uh, uh, um, uh, prisoner's dilemma games, the whole calculation is, is on the risk of a betrayal by the other, that they'll pretend to cooperate and then not cooperate. Okay, that uh, analysis of trust and the analysis of the risk of betrayal is certainly very much a part of what we have to do but it does not remove the status of cooperation as the ideal to be attained. Now, when I write the ethics of cooperation in translation, I say that when there is no possibility of cooperation, when the, the communication partners are going to betray each other or have nothing in common or have nothing to, to gain from the Communication Act, then do not translate it's not worth putting in the effort into the translation. And that's, that's the most important part of the ethics. Do something else. Go and be a journalist and write about it. Go and do your blogs. Go and be an activist in, in any other genre. Uh, because cooperation is not possible. But if cooperation is possible, then it is worth translating, worth creating involvement, worth creating trust. Okay, so it, it's not um, an ethics of all communication. It's not a naive view of, of, of the way people interact. It's a simple proposal of a general aim for translations as translations, as a particular kind of communication act. I think it follows from there that I have never made any claim to a translator being neutral. Uh, some people say, oh, cooperation assumes that the, the translator is a, a, a good broker, you know, a neutral person who can see, no, nothing of the kind. If you go through all my writings, you'll never find any claim to the neutrality of the intermediary. In fact, you'll find the opposite. I've, I've always argued that translators should look after themselves and make sure they get well paid and well treated. Uh, by the people, other people in the Communication Act and, and work in such a way that it's good for them. And then I've also claimed that it's good to support the weaker side because that enhances the, the possibilities of cooperation. 
But there is no need to pretend to be neutral. Well, now, sometimes it can help you gain trust to appear to be neutral. And I have analyzed the, the linguistic tricks by which translators achieve this. But I make no claim, no ethical claim, that translators should be neutral in their work. No, they should aim to enhance cooperation. That's the aim. Uh, some of you have asked, is it enough to do that? To enhance cooperation? Yes, I think it's enough. Is it enough to earn trust? No, I think earning trust is the entry into your act as a translator. Uh, without trust, you can't gain any of the other values. So you have to maintain that and maintain the illusions that are necessary for trust. But beyond that, there are other aims. I've given my theory, which is cooperation. Uh, you can seek other aims if you like. But for all of them, I think, if you are working as a translator, as a, a mediator between cultures, trustworthiness is your prime stock in trade. Let me summarize what I have to say then about your questions. I think I've, I've actually answered most of the questions along the way. To summarize, number one, uh, translate in such a way as to maintain, uh, create and maintain trust, okay? which means you can't just do anything you like. I'm not going to uh, uh, say that, oh, translation is always transformation. Of course it's always transformation. But uh, people have to trust that transformation in order for the act to work as translation. That is, use, if you like, whatever illusions of neutrality are convenient. I've said that translations should create involvement in the Communication Act, and, and this is quite serious, I think, because a lot of the translations that we have around these days are just boring, far more boring than, than the star text that they're reproducing, and a lot has to be done there, I think, to make translators take more risks uh, in, in linguistic terms uh, in order to engage people in communication. And then I've, I've uh, restated my position that the, the uh, ultimate ethical aim of translation is to seek cooperation between all the parties involved. And when there is no possibility of cooperation, we should not translate. We should do other things. Now, those are pretty general principles. I'm not formulating principles just for your situation or for my situation. I'm trying to think about many, many situations in different cultures and throughout history. And they don't really have specific performance guidelines. I think what we have to do uh, when we're talking about translation on this level is to outline these general principles and then in each specific translation act that we're doing or that we're studying, there we have to fill in the blanks and say, what does cooperation mean here? What kind of involvement can we hope to achieve uh, and what are the criteria uh, on which trustworthiness is, is based. All that future work is up to you, uh, either as translators or as translation scholars.